Not very long ago, and not too far away, a group of very wise people gathered together and came to the conclusion that the brain is actually not that different from any of the other organs in our body, largely unchanging throughout the course of our life. And that was the scientific consensus, as well as a thing that just many people believe. However, today, I want to tell you about the brain, and I want to tell you about how it changes. So, welcome to this handy guide to the brain rewiring itself. Now, I suppose it is only right that I introduce myself. I am a trainee neuroscientist, if I can call myself that, and a PhD student in mental health science at UCL. I initially started with studying psychology, and I fell in love with biology and neuroscience. The ability of the brain to change itself was actually a huge part of why I ended up being interested in what I am. So neuroplasticity actually changed my life. Let me tell you about it. The main character of today's talk is the brain. This is the organ that generates all of your inner experiences as a human, your thoughts, beliefs, consciousness, and I think it's pretty amazing for all that. The brain can be divided into distinct regions, including the frontal lobe, which has been traditionally linked to higher level cognitive functions, including decision making, judgments, reasoning, and problem solving. And even though these regions might seem distinct, the brain is actually incredibly interconnected, and many regions will collaborate to carry out different functions in the body. If you zoom in on the brain, you will see 86 billion of these. These are called neurons, and that is approximately almost 11 times the size of the entire human population. If you ever feel like you're not special or unique, just think about the fact that you have 86 billion of these bad boys firing in your brain, making you as a person. And I think that's pretty special. So neurons communicate with each other, and that's a way that they create messages so that the rest of the body, for example, our muscles, can understand what to do. Neurons have dendrites, those little branches, and that's where they take their information from other neurons. The message then gets passed along up until the axon terminals, which is where the neuron meets its colleague, and then the message gets passed forward. If you zoom in even further, you will be able to see a gap between different neurons. That is called a synapse, and that is where much of the neural communication takes place. The synapse is actually 20 nanometers wide. That's four to 5,000 times smaller than the width of a single human hair. Now, after this brief taster of neuroscience, I want to actually focus on neuroplasticity, which is the ability of the nervous system to change itself and give you a few examples of that. Neuroplasticity ultimately comes down to communication between neurons. And neurons communicate using electrical signals and neurotransmitters. Some of them you might already know, such as dopamine, serotonin, and noradrenaline. When neurons communicate, neuron A sends some neurotransmitter to neuron B. Neuron B then receives that neurotransmitter and it actually allows positive particles or ions to flow into neuron B and make it excited. That passes on a further electrical message. However, if this happens multi multiple times and frequently, the connections between the neurons get stronger over time. This is on a very micro scale. When we think about the entire brain, what this might look like is changes in the size of brain regions, changes in how connected they are, or changes in how they function together. One of the most famous examples of neuroplasticity in action was shown when participants were divided into two groups, one that would learn how to juggle from scratch and the other that wouldn't. The participants also had their brains scanned at three points, first before the experiment, just after the experiment had finished, and a few weeks later. So what we actually were able to see in this experiment was that there were changes in sizes in motor areas in the brain of the jugglers, but not the people who didn't learn how to juggle. There were also changes in areas related to visual attention and visual coordination of hand movements, which makes a lot of sense since those are exactly the skills that would have been used in juggling. However, one of the most important and interesting parts of this was that by the third time participants got their brains scanned, those changes actually reversed and disappeared. 
So learning can not only change our brain anatomy, but forgetting can apparently change it too. I hopefully convinced you at least a little bit that plasticity occurs when we learn. And this can be seen even with single memories. Actually, there's quite a lot of studies with mice suggesting that changing connections between neurons can implant a whole new memory or erase an existing one. There's actually some recent evidence for that in humans as well, where participants would learn about a specific object location in a task. And then when, we, when researchers looked at their brains, the changes in their brains, the larger they were, the better the participants tended to be on this task. So in this way, we can actually explain forgetting, like if you forget that one word on a vocab test in class, as weakening of those connections between neurons. You can tell that to your teacher. I cannot guarantee any extra points. However, they would surely be impressed you know that. Speaking of teachers, your brain actually can rewire itself when learning a different language. When you're learning a second language, the brain regions that get activated may actually be quite similar to the ones that you use when using your first language. However, the brain regions tend to be more activated when you're using your second language. This is especially true if, for example, you learned a second language later in life, or you're not very good at it, or you just simply haven't been exposed to it a lot. So I was learning French when I was 16, and I was lived in Switzerland for two years, but I really haven't used it since. So if any of you tried to say something to me in French right now, my brain would probably be on fire. Hopefully I've convinced you now that the brain can change in response to our experiences. But now that we know that, why exactly should we care? And there are many different implications that neuroplasticity has. However, the ones I find most interesting and important are in mental health. And neuroplasticity can actually tell us a lot about how we understand mental health. So to get more into that, let me first tell you about a concept that we are all too familiar with, stress. So if experience can change our brains, and hopefully you're quite convinced of that now, then it is reasonable to assume stress would also be able to do that. Now, that is quite a worrying thought. And, well, if it can do that, how does it do it? And can we ever hope to rewire our brains back? To focus more on these questions, I want to first examine a specific stress-related disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. To be diagnosed with PTSD, one would typically have exposure to some kind of traumatic or stressful event. And one of the symptoms of PTSD are flashbacks, which are intrusive and unwanted memories, especially ones that upset you. And there are basically what there are many different ways in which you can think about PTSD, but one of them is approaching it from memory. And since we already think that memory and neuroplasticity are related, well, maybe there's something in that. When encoding memory, our brains typically use the region called the hippocampus, which is over there. And that typically encodes where and when something happens. However, I have to tell you something about the hippocampus. It is unfortunately a little bit of a diva, and when we're stressed, it tends to shut down. There's also another region, the amygdala, which is typically linked to emotions, but it can also be activated in emotional memories. So one theory suggests that what happens when we're stressed is the amygdala dominates the memory encoding process. And then the memory becomes decontextualized. It doesn't get encoded where or when the memory happened, but it can become very it can also become activated at inappropriate times, like when you're no longer in that particular situation. And this can, to some extent, explain flashbacks in patients with PTSD. There are an abundance of rodent studies, so with rats and mice, that suggest that stress affects different brain regions differently. The amygdala, for example, is hyperactive during stress, whereas the hippocampus is less active than usual. The prefrontal cortex, the area of the brain that is typically linked to those higher level cognitive functions, actually tends to lose volume in stress. 
We also know there are, there's an abundance of plasticity happening in the amygdala when stressed, and way less plasticity in the hippocampus. However, you may have some very valid criticisms here. Hey, the stresses that animals get exposed to while in labs are probably very different to the ones that people actually experience. And you're absolutely right. However, there are studies of patients with PTSD, and those studies suggest that their amygdala tends to be overactive, and some aspects of their prefrontal cortices seem to be less active. So now that we know all that, can we actually hope to rewire our brains back? And unfortunately, there is no straightforward answer. However, this is an area of extremely active research, and there are many experimental directions being pursued. One of them, perhaps very surprising, is doing research with ketamine. Ketamine is an anesthetic drug. It has also been used as an antidepressant for treatment-resistant depression, so for, potentially for people who, for whom normal, like, more, well, typical your antidepressants did not really work. And ketamine has a lot of different effects, especially side effects. It can cause anxiety or hallucinations. But one of its many effects is inducing synaptic plasticity. And it gives some indication that possibly we would be able to rewire our brains back from the damage of stress. However, whereas some studies have been done in humans, this is still very experimental. Now, I also want to talk to you about something maybe a little bit more common in terms of mental health conditions, depression. To be diagnosed with depression, one would typically have to have something like low mood or loss of pleasure in everyday life and any kind of like interest in activities that previously brought you joy. There is quite, an, quite a lot of literature in the scientific community suggesting that there are brain changes associated with depression, uh, such as neuronal density loss in the hippocampus and different regions of the prefrontal cortex. However, we can also think about corrective neuroplasticity. So whether the different treatments we have available for depression can actually rewire our brain and change it to a non-depressed state. Now, even with the variety of treatments we do have, not all of them will actually work for all patients. We have medication, brain stimulation, and psychotherapy, some of the more common ways of treating depression. In antidepressants, actually patients who have gotten antidepressants, they seem to have improved connectivity be between prefrontal cortex and different brain regions, including the hippocampus, and that is correlated with improvements in depression symptoms. Additionally, antidepressants have been shown to promote creation of new neurons and calm down the amygdala. For brain stimulation, that changes how active and how likely to be activated our frontal lobes are. So that in it induces plasticity in those frontal lobes. And actually, that is also correlated with improvements in depression symptoms. And finally, psychotherapy. There's a very, this is a very active area of research where we look at how psychotherapy can potentially change the brain. And the review from 2022 actually stated that the changes in your behavior and thinking that therapy brings about and causes actually may be able to rewire your brain back to a non-depressed state. So hopefully I've convinced you that too much stress is really not good for you. And your brain can respond to those adverse environments. However, there is always hope for some change. And I find this comforting and hopeful, both as a scientist, researching these conditions and hoping to help people who live with them, as well as a person. It is comforting to know that there is potential for change, even if something awful has happened to us. But now, why am I talking to you all about this? That is actually because many of you are in this magical period of life called adolescence. And there are a lot of things changing, including your brains. We actually used to think that adolescent brains were not very different from child or adult brains. However, now we know that not to be the case. And one of the brain regions that undergoes the most intense development is the medial prefrontal cortex. The medial prefrontal cortex is actually more active in adolescents than in adults when trying to understand other people. 
the connectivity between this brain region and other regions of so-called the social brain network also gets stronger over time during your teenage years. And the social brain network is responsible for you understanding other people. And finally, generally for prefrontal cortex, connections keep getting stronger with other brain regions over adolescence. This actually may have implications for control, for cognitive and behavioral control. So as we get older, we actually get better at stopping impulsive behavior or making optimal reasoning and decision. So that is actually possibly related to the fact that the prefrontal cortex is undergoing this very intense period of development. Over our childhood, there are a lot of synapses forming, so those sites where neurons communicate. But then, around adolescence, there's this period of synapse elimination or synaptic pruning. And can we, this is actually indicating that the brain is specializing. Now, can we in any way use this to our advantage? Well, there is no clear answer. However, from what we know about neuroplasticity, we can infer that the strongest connections and pathways and synapses will not get pruned away and eliminated. So, um, presumably, the unused connections are eliminated and useful ones are strengthened. So, it is in our best interest to strengthen connections that could be beneficial to us later on. Adolescence is a period when you can set yourself up for a positive spiral, establishing good habits in your life, including maybe exercising or work ethic, or maybe just good practices for socializing and building relationships. Every choice that you make has the potential to change your brain. And while not everyone will actually trigger neuroplasticity, many of the choices will add up over time. Finally, just a few messages that I'd really would like you to remember from this talk. The brain is adaptive and it will change depending on your experience. There is always hope and there is value in doing something consistently and establishing good habits. Finally, the time to act is now. Neuroplasticity changed my life and what I do with it. Maybe it will change yours too. In fact, I'm pretty sure it already has. Thank you.